Hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar. My name is Andy Finch and I'm the Chief Executive Officer of Canaccord Genuity's international business based in Guernsey. This is the latest in our regular series of investment market updates and I'm delighted to be joined by Michelle Pereira, Chief Investment Officer for Canaccord Genuity Wealth Management. When planning this event, we thought it would be useful to ask Michelle to provide an update on two of our key investment themes for 2022, which are inflation and climate transition. Given that our most recent market update was in November, today's event feels well-timed given the uncertainty faced by investors. Whether this relates to the increase in inflation globally or the morally repugnant events unfolding in Ukraine, as consumers, we are all impacted by higher inflation but the key question for today is how can we navigate this as investors? Just a reminder, before we start the main feature, that we encourage you to ask questions that matter to you. So if you have any questions, please email questions at canaccord.com and we will endeavor to answer as many as we can. That's more than enough from me, so I'd like to hand you over to Michelle. Good morning. Um... Andy, good morning, everybody. Um, well, uh, as Andy said, the, the tragedy of the war in Ukraine and the very upsetting scenes that we've been seeing uh, recently have changed a lot of things for markets. But in fact, a lot of things were already changing before the conflict. So we have to try and understand these movements and what we can do about them. Uh, as Andy said, the most important thing that we're facing right now as consumers and investors alike is inflation. We've already discussed inflation a few times before in these calls, but the numbers have been getting worse and they may yet hit, hit a peak, whether it's in the US, the UK and Europe in the next few months. So before we can talk about what to do about inflation, let's look at the inflation picture. On this slide, you can see the PCE, which is uh, personal consumption expenditures, and the core PCE, which is the dark blue line, is the inflation gauge used by the US Federal Reserve, which is the f known as the Fed, which is the US Central Bank. And as you can see, they have a target of 2% for core inflation, um, and that's the uh, dotted red line. For about 20 years, 25 years, uh, we were right about on the dotted red line, and suddenly the curve has gone vertical. So it has soared, and it's much higher than it has been for almost 40 years. Uh, now, the, um, the Fed is focusing on the dark blue line, which is excluding food and energy, but the light blue line above includes food and energy. As, and as you can see, over the last 40 years, it's actually been consistently higher. So the Fed has a bias to focus on the one excluding food and energy, even though consumers have to pay the one including food and energy. On the next slide, we can see the better known measurement of inflation, which is called the consumer price index. And that consumer price index actually has two components. It has a flexible component and a sticky component. That means that different parts of the uh, consumer basket are either moving much faster or they tend not to move very much. As you can see, the flexible part of the CPI has gone through the roof and it's close to 20 percent whereas the sticky part actually doesn't move that much. But even that one is getting much closer to 5%, whereas it was about 2% at the beginning of the period. Now, can we have the next slide, please? This is a very important impact on inflation, which is unemployment. Uh, we currently have very close to full employment in the US, in the UK, and in many other countries. This is the UK. And uh, the point of full employment is that when there is uh, full employment, it weighs on inflation. It actually adds to inflation. Uh, by definition, a tight job market 
feeds into higher prices. So in conclusion, we had very high inflation already before the Ukraine crisis. Um, and the question is, what will the war in Ukraine do to inflation? Well, the immediate impact on markets has been through uh, the price of energy and other commodities and materials. After all, Russia is one of the largest exporters of oil, gas, and other metals. Together with Ukraine, Russia is also a major exporter of wheat and fertilizers. So uh, the sanctions against Russia are therefore going to add uh, to higher energy and food prices. And the situation can also create disruptions to many uh, important materials like titanium and palladium, which are used in many manufactured products. So now we need to understand a little bit how badly we can be affected by the sanctions on Russia and the interruption to supply chains. Markets have reacted very negatively to the higher oil prices and higher natural gas prices, assuming that the consumer will be hit and that energy prices are going to hurt many economic sectors. Uh, and there is now a regular comparison that is being made in the press and in the media in general with the 1970s, with the expectation that uh, we're also going to have, uh, have what existed in the 1970s, namely stagflation, which is a combination of economic stagnation and inflation. So let's look at it. Can we have the next slide, please? This shows you the energy dependency. Uh, it's very, very clear that we are not as energy dependent as we used to be in the 1970s. Many things have happened. Conservation measures, more efficient manufacturing, better home insulation, and also an economy that has moved much more towards uh, services than to uh, in industry. The difference between the 1970s and right now is quite stark when you look at the graph. Uh, our energy intensity has been greatly reduced. Uh, basically, the energy used by unit of GDP growth has plummeted. The other thing that is very important is energy imports, not just energy usage. Um, energy imports are very important uh, to European countries indeed, but much less so for the US, which is the economy that really matters for the financial markets. Uh, the fracking business in the US has basically superseded the massive energy imports, particularly from the Middle East. Uh, that uh, the U.S. used to, uh, to have, uh, the U.S. now imports a very small percentage of oil from Russia and could very easily replace these imports uh, through additional output uh, from the Permian Basin in Texas. Uh, crucially, that means that as far as the U.S. economy is concerned, it doesn't matter whether the oil price is going up or down because the economy is neither being hurt nor uh, helped by oil prices. Okay, so now we know that inflation is going to be higher. Now we know that commodity prices are going to hurt, but they're not necessarily going to make it as bad as in the 1970s. All the same, the central banks have now embarked upon a tightening regime whereby they're going to raise interest rates significantly over time. Last week, we had both the Fed and the Bank of England raising interest rates by 25 basis points, which is a quarter of 1%. Um, and um, they, this is the beginning of a process. Uh, but if you look at what is called real interest rates, that is interest rates minus inflation, you can see they've never been so negative. Uh, we are now at a very highly negative level. And um, therefore, um, this graph is going to have to change either because inflation is going to fall or because interest rates are going to rise. 
And most likely it's going to be a combination of both. But this graph is going to have to go up. So it basically means that the era of zero interest rates is gone for good. On the next slide, we now look at the impact of the Russia-Ukraine conflict on inflation and on the economy in general. It certainly looks like Europe is likely to be more affected than the US. After all, Europe imports a lot of Russian gas and oil. They import 40% of their gas from Russia, 25% uh, of their oil from Russia. Um, also, uh, Germany was already on the brink of a recession before the uh, Ukraine war, so uh, it wouldn't take much to tip it into a recession, and it could bring the Eurozone down with it as well. Um, so this is one of the issues that is hurting uh, Europe. In the US, however, um, the consumers have received three checks in the post from the US government, uh, what is called helicopter money. Uh, and they're sitting on a very high um, uh, savings rate, which they can use to offset the price of goods and services which are going up. Um, so that is actually helping uh, uh, consumer spending in the US. Also, of course, the Fed is likely to raise interest rates significantly this year, which means if the situation gets worse in the conflict, they could actually postpone some of these rate hikes. Uh, but I think uh, also, more importantly, the US has uh, a much better employment situation than any other part of the world. Currently, there are 11 million job openings in the US, which is 5 million more than there are job seekers, which provides a huge support to consumption. After all, if you're not afraid of losing your job, you spend more. Of course, uh, any time there is a war or another geopolitical event, markets tend to fall. It's very tempting to follow the herd and sell equities and other risk, risk assets just because of the Ukraine conflict. But does this make sense? Well, not if you look at past history. This is what happened over the last 80 years, every time you had a geopolitical crisis. Markets tend to fall for one month. They probably also uh, fall for about three months, but uh, after six months, they tend to recover very significantly. And after 12 months, they definitely have recovered. Uh, so it doesn't make sense to follow the herd and sell when everybody is selling at the beginning of a crisis. Now, of course, there are exceptions. You're going to uh, uh, point out those exceptions. Yes, but in 1940, we went into World War II. So obviously it took a lot longer for the stock market to recover. And sometimes you're already in a recession uh, and therefore it takes a bit longer for the economy to recover. It's not simply going to recover because there is a geopolitical event. And that was the case of 9-11, which happened when the US had just got into a recession. Uh, next slide. Uh, but at the end of the day, why do we buy the stock market? Well, because equities follow corporate earnings and investors don't just buy markets. Investors buy a share in a business which is benefiting from its changing fortunes over time. And as you can see, the correlation between stock prices and earnings is very strong over the long term. Uh, company earnings are the biggest driver of equities, even when interest rates are going up. This is an example here. This is the US index, the S&P 500. And you can see that earnings estimates are actually continuing to rise. Uh, and they're continuing to rise in every economic sector as we speak. Uh, what is very important, though, is it's not just about earnings going up, but it's also about profit margins. Uh, you know, it's interesting to look at how infl inflation is affecting corporate profits. At the beginning of this year, 
we outlined how some equities can protect against rising inflation. And this should still be the case, despite the downdraft in markets that we've seen this year. Well, why is that? Because in an inflationary environment, a lot of firms simply pass on their costs to their own customers. So their profits rise in line with inflation. Many companies currently seem to have the pricing power to do so. Not all of them can do, of course. It's painstaking work actually to pick the right ones. It's not just a spreadsheet. Uh, but look at profit margins. The profit margins we are seeing here in the US in yellow and in the UK in blue are actually rising very significantly. Um, they, have, they have no sign whatsoever of dropping due to inflation. Nobody is cutting dividends, unlike what we had two years ago in 2020 after COVID. Uh, so yes, the thesis we put forward at the beginning of the year three months ago that equities can protect against inflation is still valid. Now, of course, it's not just a question of picking the right stocks, it's also a question of picking the right sectors and countries. And this is where um, the different uh, markets in the world present you with different opportunities. Uh, as we can see in the US, uh, the US is a market that is dominated by technology. And it's not just what is called information technology on this table, but it's also what's called communication services and consumer discretionary, or at least a great part of that. So when you add it all together, half of the US market has a tech color to it. Uh, when you go to the rest of the world, you have a completely different picture. You have much more in financials, which are basically banks and insurance companies. You can see that the UK, for instance, has quite a lot in uh, energy and materials. Um, in fact, more than most other countries uh, in the Western world, other than Canada and Australia, um, Japan is much heavier in industrials. Emerging markets um, also seem to have quite a lot of financials, but they also have tech. And don't forget that China is the second market in the world for technology after the US. Uh, uh, so you can play different sectors, either by playing them directly or by playing them through country allocation. The FTSE 100, for instance, is dominated by commodities, consumer staples, financials, and some industrials. Now you've probably seen this uh, slide before. At the beginning of the year, we didn't just talk about inflation protection, we also talked about uh, energy transition. And these are the different themes that follow uh, ESG uh, principles, environmental, social, and governance topics, which is also known as responsible investing. Quite a few of them are very relevant today. When you look at robotics, and artificial intelligence. When you look at cybersecurity on the social side, uh, very important these days. On the environmental side, you can look at battery technology, uh, you can look at energy efficiency, and you can look at sustainable food. Uh, these are extremely important topics these days. You also have oncology in healthcare, uh, very important after all the time when uh, hospitals haven't really focused so much on cancer. Um, so all of these issues are likely to be very relevant today. After all, don't forget that the current shortage in energy doesn't simply have to be solved by drilling more oil and pumping more gas, but by using renewable energy. Historically, renewables moved up when the oil price rose. We haven't seen this yet in the Ukraine situation, but we could well do at some point. And food is also going to be a major issue now that the wheat planting season has been compromised in Ukraine. Uh, lastly, we were often critis criticized by speaking too much about equities and not enough about other asset classes. Uh, when central banks embark upon a tightening cycle, uh, bond yields tend to rise for quite some time. 
Uh, some of the losses we have seen in government bonds over the last 12 months could well continue for some time. More importantly, the traditional role of government bonds in a portfolio has been to protect when equities were going down. And unfortunately, government bonds seem to have relinquished that function uh, recently. They don't protect so much when things go wrong. On the other hand, an asset that has protected quite well during the peak of the Ukraine crisis is gold. We've often mentioned gold as uh, a defensive investment in a balanced portfolio, and it could still play this role. Gold has been helped by the amounts of cash thrown at uh, the US economy by the Fed called quantitative easing, but it also reacts to many other sector factors, including geopolitical risk. If further risks emanate from the Russia-Ukraine conflict, then gold might well be a way to protect one's own risk assets better than gilts or treasuries. So now in summary, although markets have been hit by a double whammy of higher inflation and the Ukraine war, the fundamentals are still positive and our 2022 themes of inflation protection and energy transition are still very valid right now. And that's all from me, Andy. Okay, so uh, thank you, Michelle, for your uh, very interesting presentation. I thought it was supported by some uh, fascinating charts. Uh, I'm sure perhaps like me, many of you listening today, it would have prompted some questions in your mind. So just a reminder, uh, questions at canaccord.com. We'll be delighted to deal with as many of those as we can. And I'd now like to introduce Richard Champion. He's our Deputy Chief Investment Officer. Richard's been compiling, compiling the questions asked so far and uh, will endeavour to answer them. Richard. Thanks, Andy, and good morning, everyone. Thanks for uh, taking the time out of your busy days to uh, tune in to us. Uh, so questions. We've had quite a few. Thank you very much for them. I'm going to start with one which is asking whether central banks, uh, particularly perhaps the Bank of England, given that where we sit today, are doing enough or are, are they behind the curve? Um, uh, in particular, given the negative real interest rates that Michelle mentioned. Um, I think the answer here is that what central banks, and we'll come to governments in a minute, are both trying to do is to get back to some kind of normality, because what we had during the pandemic was absolutely not normal, um, with rates lower than they'd ever been in recorded history, and governments obviously splurging enormous amounts of cash to keep the economy going. Uh, through furlough or those checks that Michelle mentioned earlier as well. So we have been in, a, in an extraordinary period and central banks know that they need to get back to something more normal, particularly because, you, as, as the questioner pointed out, you can't crush inflation by running negative uh, real interest rates. So we do expect uh, the, uh, the rises uh, in interest rates we've begun to see to continue through the year, perhaps not as many as before because of what's going on in Ukraine, but we do expect further rises. Indeed, last night in the States, um, Jay Powell, the chair of the Fed, uh, was mentioning the possibility of using half percent increases rather than quarter percent increases at potentially more than one meeting. So I think we will see further action by central banks to address that gap between the interest rates and the real rate. And the second point to mention is that by the end of the year, we really don't think we'll be seeing the, the really worrying headline rates we're seeing right now. So again, that uh, negative interest rate gap will begin to close uh, in a more natural way. Um, the second question is about energy security and how uh, following what's going on in uh, Ukraine and the sanctions placed on Russia, uh, governments and societies will adapt, and in particular whether this means that renewables will take a, a back seat to uh, a resumption in uh, old-fashioned carbon energy sources. Um, a few points to make here. I think in the short term there will be a mix uh, as the policy response. We had Shell just yesterday saying that they're going to reopen uh, development of a, of a gas field uh, off, offshore Shetland. Uh, and I'm sure we'll see some more of that kind of development. 
because with high oil prices, it's very profitable for oil companies to uh, dig the stuff out of the ground. Um, however, high energy costs actually make the competitiveness of renewable energy that much better because clearly uh, uh, in that environment, the, the price of energy from renewables, which has been falling very rapidly, will look even more attractive than it was before. So I think you've got to bear that in mind. It's possible we'll see a little bit of a pullback, a delay in some of the carbon neutrality targets that government's been talk, uh, talking about, particularly in Europe, where the degree of dependence on Russian oil is greater, Russian oil and, of course, Russian gas. But it will only be a delay because we've got to bear in mind, and it's our central uh, case, that we are in a climate emergency uh, that needs urgent action to uh, address and so that's not going to go away, even if some of the targets slip by a few years to allow uh, the uh, energy supply routes to be readjusted. Um, so I think actually uh, it's still a good opportunity for renewable energy in this environment. Uh, other questions we've had, um, one which I uh, referred to a little bit was the impact of what we're seeing today on government revenues. Uh, and indeed on taxes, so government taxes and spending. Uh, tomorrow we have Rishi Sunak standing up to uh, give his um, spring statement, uh, and there's a lot of speculation in the press that there may be uh, reductions in uh, petrol taxes or a deferral of the national insurance increase we're expecting from next month. And of course that's one uh, avenue that the government can take to address the squeeze on consumption that we're seeing, you know, eye-wateringly high petrol and, and diesel prices at the pumps. Um, and of course, that's combined with increases in food, food price inflation. So we may, may see some action on that front from government, uh, governments. And that means that their efforts, again, to normalize, to get back to a proper sustainable balance of spending and taxation uh, is gonna take a little bit longer particularly because we're all talking about it now, defense spending is likely to increase fairly markedly in all the Western countries, particularly some of the European ones which are lagging the US in that regard. So I'm afraid it means uh, it's gonna take longer to get back to that kind of preferred level of uh, sustainable government finances of somewhere between 60 and 80% uh, of uh, debt to GDP ratios. Most countries are significantly above that, uh, the UK included, uh, and it is going to take longer. And typically that means that crowds out uh, broader economic growth. So it probably means slightly less growth going forward. But of course, that also means probably in the longer term, less pressure on inflation. So there is a, a silver lining to that particular cloud. We've answered a little bit the next question, which was, where can you hide if we do get stagflation? Michelle's talked about gold, um, which we have in our client portfolios. There are also areas that we, we can invest in, uh, like uh, TIPS, Treasury Inflation Protected Securities, that's index-linked gilts, but only, uh, only in the States, um, where you get uh, a, a protection against the rises in inflation uh, with bond-like characteristics. But you've got to acknowledge that if we do get stagflation, and let's all hope that we don't, and we don't expect that we will in any kind of persistent way, it's not a good place to be for asset markets. Interest rates typically go up and equities tend to struggle because valuations come under pressure. So let's hope we don't get that. Our, our core case is that's not the end um, we're gonna see by, by the end of this year. That's not where we're gonna be by the end of this year. And those worries will subside somewhat as we approach them. Um, the next question uh, is a, a quite simple one. When do we see the peak in inflation? Uh, prior to Ukraine, most forecasters saw April next month as being the peak with a level around 8%, which is uh, the highest we've seen for decades. Um, now, of course, uh, we're going to see probably a slightly higher level and a delayed peak, but not for a very long period because a number of the base effects will drop out. So that peak is likely to come a few months after April uh, and maybe into early midsummer. But we are expecting inflation to be declining by the end of the year. 
Um, the thing to bear in mind when you get worried about energy price increases is that oil is what's called a fungible commodity, i.e. you can, um, if you can't sell it to, if you're Russian and you can't sell it to Germany or Britain or America, uh, you can sell it to the Chinese and the Chinese then don't buy so much as it were from Qatar or Oman, um, they, they'll, they'll buy it from Russia instead. Uh, and then that oil finds its way around to the West. So although it takes time for energy to adjust and clearly um, that adjustment process takes uh, a lot of organization, uh, it can adjust. And as Michelle alluded to in terms of the Permian Basin, the fracking oil, if you like, in the States, it takes less time to adjust in that kind of uh, oil uh, exploration than it does in traditional oil exploration. So by the end of the year, it's possible we'll see 700,000 extra barrels coming out of the United States, for example. So I think there are things which can happen um, uh, to uh, uh, get inflation to abate. Uh, and the final question I have for the time being, uh, Andy, is uh, about the oil sector and how we should uh, look at this. It wasn't that long ago that most people thought of the oil sector as something of a pariah, a, a bit of a dog, if I could put it that way, because the major companies are all having to tra a transition from digging carbon out of the ground and selling it to people so they can burn it to generating energy or uh, supplying energy uh, in more renewable ways. And that's an enormous transition for them to uh, go through. And it's one of the reasons that many, many investors have not liked the sector. Uh, obviously, at the moment, there's something of a windfall going to the oil companies, uh, because having spent the first part of the pandemic cutting costs to reduce their price of production, uh, because if you remember, and it seems a, a long time ago, it, this time two years ago, briefly in the States, the price of oil actually went negative. You were paid to take it away. Uh, it was only very briefly uh, for a couple of days, but um, it nonetheless did um, point to some of the longer term problems that, that may face oil. So um, yes, at the moment, the oil companies are having uh, enormous cash flow uh, come through to them. They're not at the moment reinvesting huge amounts of that in renewed exploration outside of things like the Permian Basin. Um, so that means shareholders uh, are due a lot of returns with one proviso, and we see a lot of this in the press at the moment. Governments are looking at those enormous profits. They're looking at potentially uh, reducing fuel duties to help consumers. Uh, how symmetrical it would be were they to then uh, levy a windfall tax on the energy sector to capture those windfall profits they're gain, gaining at the moment. So although the oil sector has done very well this year for obvious reasons, uh, just I think we, th there are calls for caution um, uh, for the longer term. Uh, Andy, that completes the questions we've had so far. So I will hand back to you. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, thanks, Richard. That was uh, super helpful. Thank you. Um, some very interesting questions and uh, some very clear answers as to our views on what the likely impact is going to be. So uh, as we've all heard, current events are undoubtedly going to impact us both as consumers and investors. And whenever there is a period of uncertainty, I'd encourage you to get in touch with your usual Adam & Co or Canaccord contact to discuss any aspects of either today's events, the issues that we've covered, or to allow us to navigate your way through the challenges. Um, ultimately, we're here to enable you to uh, invest with confidence. So thanks again to Michelle and Richard, to you, the audience, for joining us today and your fascinating questions. We appreciate you being here. Look forward to seeing you next time. Thank you.